Okay, so let me show you what I have in mind, uh, which is, I'll put it down. So I'm thinking of this face, and I think that would be a lot of fun to do. And again, I really think I could, once I establish the eyes and the nose and the expression, the body will be basically left as white and we'll be able to, you know, not have to fuss over that too much. Um, so I have it already drawn out and I um, am ready to show you how to do this. Um, as I always say, the most important thing is the eyes. So I'm gonna get uh, some brushes ready. I'll need a few different sizes to do this, but. I really want to get that uh, really beautiful, reflective, glassy, dreamy, I love you look, right? That's in his eyes. We just sense that. It's so nice. And that's one of the just most beautiful things about animals. So I'm going to dip into a little bit of a great color that I love to use, which is my indigo. And I'm going to just start with a nice outline of his eyes and here you know where we have to worry about having too much eyeliner on you know little girls this one we're able to take it and really spread it out because with a little bit of water on the tip of my brush just let it move and really have it be that beautiful eye expression that they have and i'll let howie just strum away in the background with us mm -hmm. And yell if you have any questions, of course. So my, I'm definitely gonna use a little bit of my um, other darker colors. So this is really where I'm making more of a secret sauce kind of color, meaning I'm using a lot of my darks. I don't have black in my palette. You guys sort of know that about me. Of course, we have to monitor how fast everything dries because it will dry pretty fast with this heat. So my darkest darks are my indigo and my violet, a nice bluish violet, and a little bit of my Van Dyke Brown. Those are really my best dark colors. And the three of those together, even if I'm mixing it live on the paper, is, will give me a very nice, soft feeling to the to the color rather than going for black, which I just feel is such a tough color to work with. I'd rather create my darks. And I'm just letting a little of that, those colors sort of seep right in here into the uh, color part of the eye and that nice reflection, which we really want to hold on to. And that sweet little looking up face. I want to get a, there's a, there is a reddish brown in there. So I'm going to go into my, um, my burnt sienna and drop a little burnt sienna in there. And it's all wet into wet at this point. So I'm just really, I'm going to move this, my cameras down a little bit so that you get a little closer. Ah, oh, there we go. It was sort of set for a bigger painting. That's a good start to one eye. I'm gonna to go to the other one. Again, start with the outline. It's such a nice gift to give people if they have a pet and you see a, a particular photo that speaks to you. I gave the one I did two weeks ago to my girlfriend of the two dogs. And oh boy, was she just thrilled with that. It's just such a wonderful thing to, to give to people and, and to know how to do for yourself also. And of course it just takes practice. So that's my indigo. I'm going into my Van Dyke Brown just to deepen it a little bit, add a little warmth. And the purple actually adds a really nice dark and yet some interesting uh, variations of color. I'm gonna go right into that eye. I'm 
want to get some of the warmer brown in there. And by mixing on the paper versus the palette, it really does allow for a lot more interesting colors to sort of pop up. And even though um, uh, they are mixing, when they dry, they tend to really have a very nice, uh, beautiful tone to them. You could sort of see all the colors and yet it reads as one color. I'm gonna switch brushes. I'm gonna to go to a little bit larger brush. This is about a number 10. And I wanna get some of that tan color in his face while this is all sort of drying. I don't wanna to go too far with the eyes until I sort of can see how it's drying. And it's important to move around a painting too. That's really um, very, uh, something I really recommend is not just staying in one spot on a painting. Hard to paint if you're just stuck in one spot. So to get that nice tan color, I think I'm gonna to go to my, um, a nice uh, warm brown color, which is a, what is this? I don't know. I'd have to look at my palette, what is it? A burnt umber and a little bit of burnt sienna. It's a nice combination. Just wanna get a little bit of tone in him. He's got a really cute little white spot right down his eyes right down his nose, to his nose, I should say. So I love to move around a painting. It just makes it feel like I'm getting the entire little personality and I'm not stuck on any one spot for too long. This is on dry paper. I haven't really added any water to the paper yet to have it move. So I'm just letting it sort of do its own little movement here. So it's just a combination of some of my browns. And all those little like eyebrows and all the little different facial expressions, I'll get those in a second. We have to build it. And as I see, as I add these colors, what I'm feeling is that um, his eyes are maybe not dark enough, but that's okay because, right, we could go right back in and add some colors. So it's really not a problem at all. That's just the way we paint. And one of your YouTube viewers uh, is asking, why is black a difficult color to work with? It's a um, good question. And thank you for asking that. Um, it, I find it very dead, a deadening color as opposed to when you mix and you find your colors, even though it dries um, with seeing all the different colors, when, it, when black dries, it's just black. When these other colors dry, there's a, a life to them. It has a beautiful life to them, which you definitely, you know, I mean, I want my paintings to have that. So maybe I should just say, I find it difficult to work with it and maybe other people don't. I would just rather mix it and get a color that's a little bit more interesting than um, using black. Black just to me deadens a, uh, a painting. So it's a very personal thing, doesn't make, and I say this in my classes all the time, doesn't make, Anybody who uses those colors wrong and me right is just a matter of my approach. Okay, let's get that nose. Little puppy noses are very funny little things. So you just have to suggest them in a really fun little way. So the darkest spot is really the inside of their nostrils. Let me switch brushes and get a little bit smaller brushes here. It's good to have all your brushes ready to go too because I like to switch them up a lot. When you get used to mixing on your palette versus your uh, pa uh, mixing on your paper rather than your palette, it just gives you a really, it's really a nice thing to sort of get used to doing. A lot of people mix in their palette, I get it. It's, it's a way in which you can find your colors very, very quickly. 
and you will know what's going down on your paper. It, it's something I don't really worry about. I just really like the idea of seeing all these great colors come out on my paper itself. And you'll start seeing them dry into these beautiful colors, which is nice. I think it's a nice way to go. And, you know, I have to tell you, it's so funny because there is there is a point that you're like, you know, we say this in class, oh, my goodness, I have a hot mess. The goal is to really work through things to a point where you understand what you have to do to get yourself in a position where you're happy with what's happening. And you may not always like what's happening in the moment, but you work with it, right? You work with it. So this is very wet right now. So I'm going to move away from his nose and I am going to feather this up a little bit because there is that little bit of a feathering that comes up on their, from their nose to their schnoot on the top of their nose. So by giving it a little bit of water, by, by having my brush sort of just touch that with a little bit of water, there's a very soft movement there. and a lot of correction techniques that we could do too. So I want that to dry as I was letting the eyes dry. And let's go back to other spots that are going on on him. So, so some of these are starting to dry a little bit and I wanna just build some of these little marks that are on his face a little bit. It's got those little eyebrows that just say, pet me, don't you love me? Aren't you gonna feed me or whatever? those little expressions mean. I could see that that has a lot of water and not a lot of um, color to it. So I definitely want to control this coming up a little bit because a lot of that color seeped up into there, which I wanted it to do and took away from the nose. So as that dries, I'm going to go back in there. Painting is a building process. And the more I work on the eyes, the more they're starting to have that really nice, you know, um, feel to them just takes a little time and you have to um, give them a chance to dry and then ad adapt to what's happening on the paper. He's got nice pink in his ears. Let's go to the ears first for a moment. I think I'll add a little bit of violet in there, right in there, maybe a little dragon's blood. As you guys know, one of my favorite colors. Okay, to the other ear. There's a lot of cute little folds and everything in here, but I don't know how much of that I really need to have to say it's an ear. You know, ears like on people are funny little things. <laughs> They're very odd little things with lots of funny folds and little crevices. And how much of that you really want to do is really up to you. And how much of that you just might want to suggest. I'm more into suggesting it. You'll notice that I use my drying mat a lot to when I'm switching colors to figure, you know, to adapt to how much paint is and water is on my my brush at any given time. I'm gonna go back to that nose. 
The eyes, nose, ears, those are really important characteristics. Okay, it's pretty dry. I'm gonna go back and work on it some more. You guys are very quiet tonight. If there's anyone on YouTube that would like to type in a question, I'll be happy to convey it. Thank you, Harbor Fields Library and South Huntington Library for sponsoring these four. This is the fourth of four Jan Cams. So I thank you guys for taking this, uh, you know, time to do this with, with me. It's been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And hopefully everybody has, you know, enjoyed the scene sort of a little bit more of my process instead of worrying about, certainly for my students worrying about like painting, they just get to watch. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of nice that you guys could just sit back and grab your cocktail and watch something happen. Jan, am I uh, correct in this? In remembering that you were recently featured in the Huntington Arts Council paper? Um, actually, thank you for mentioning that. It was not the Huntington Arts, but it was um, the Beacon Times, which is um, a paper that goes from Huntington to Riverhead on the North Shore. And uh, yeah, I got a very uh, substantial, uh, I got the centerfold. Can't say that would happen very often or much, but I got the, I got the cover in the centerfold. Uh, anybody it's um it is i did post it on my facebook page and there is a link but yeah thank you for mentioning that susan um it was an interview a really nice interview that i had with uh irene ruddick and um i got uh i got a really um wonderful wonderful response from it totally unexpected you never know what's going to come in the course of a day. <laughs> so um, let's see, let's go with this pink. Just want to build some of these little folds a little bit in his ear. I just don't have to go too far with them. I can just suggest them. People know their ears. We do not have to over uh, complicate things. Okay, I feel like his face is sort of coming together. I think people give up on their paintings a little too fast and they're too quick to judge it. And uh, I really um, love the idea of just giving yourself a little bit of a a break and not allowing it to happen, you know, uh, allowing all the skills and that you have to sort of start building it. Now, the question is, is how do you indicate something white? And we talked about that a little bit last week. And one of the ways that I like to do it is with a uh, sort of suggested pinky purple kind of color. It sort of reads as white, especially when we build that background. Nice, soft, yeah. And mostly white is the paper, right? In watercolor. You'll notice I turn my paper around a lot because I don't want to disturb here where my hand is. So I'll turn the paper and it's a more um, pleasing way for me to get the marks that I want to have happen on the paper.
And there's a coolness, you know, whites have like a cool side, a warm side. Um, so just his eye is dripping a little bit. Oh no, don't cry. Just dropping that a little bit, drying it. So this particular painting is going to require a background to get the, um, the puppy to stand out or at least a shadow to showcase his body. And so that's gonna be a really important part of this. So we'll get, we'll get to that. sort of indicated maybe a little bit of the uh, the wood that he's on, the wood planking. When I put color down, I really feel like there's plenty of time for me to take it and move it and, and find places that I could add them some color. So I'm adding a little blue into his face because now that I have it on his body, it really makes sense to bridge the palette and have it go into his face a little bit. I just wanna lighten that up a little bit. There we go. Perfect. And he does have a little bit of that tan color on him. So I want to be sure that that gets melted into the color here a little bit. And then he's got a, a really little spot on his hindquarters right here that is tan also. So I'm always monitoring how much water to how much color is on my brush at any time. It's just something that I'm always looking to either change the color or monitor if, oh, I can see I have too much water. Oh, I can see I have too much color. Oh, I just want to take that color and move it. Whatever it is, I want to be sure to have that be something that I could control. And this, this mat really does give me a lot of control. It adds to all the control that, because, you know, watercolors are like kind of lack of control. <laughs> As my students know, it's like controlled chaos, but there's a lot of ways to fix and correct and change and adjust your colors. So I, I like to use everything at that it's at my disposal to make the process as easy and as enjoyable as possible. So, okay, so now I feel like I've got most of him done. I can't really decide if I need to do more or not because I've got to do a background to really have him pop up because it's just so light. So I'm going to switch brushes and I'm going to use a much bigger brush. And I'm going to, um, I think what I'm going to do is use my... Okay, I got my sexy scumble brush here. So I want to build a nice tone in the background. And what I'm going to use is, is probably a combination of my indigo and my dragon's blood. That makes a very interesting toned down brownish kind of color. But um, rather than just going for brown, what this will do is give me a really nice uh you'll see both of those colors in a very nice way. You'll see the blue and you'll see the dragon's blood, the, the, uh, the um, orange color. And there he is, you could see him starting to pop. And one of the things I like to suggest is that in the photo, just because it's a certain way does not mean you are bound to copy 
the photo exactly. You don't have to do that. You are not, you're able as the artist to sort of make choices and edit. Editing your choices of what you're painting and what you're not or how you're painting it is super important. It, it's very important to me as an artist. So what we're doing here is basically what we call reverse definition. And what that means is that we are painting the dog, I wish I knew his name, by painting the background. And so I'm defining his, uh, his body by painting the background. So um, reverse definition, it's a nice way to paint. It's nice to know you always have that at your disposal. Otherwise you might, your, your painting might get a little too outliney. And you'll notice that I'm leaving little white spots, which we also fondly call holidays. And there's a reason why we call them holidays. A, a student told me, she said something to the effect like, oh, I love your holidays. I'm like, I'm not sure I understand. And she said holidays was something that was a term years ago when her father would paint a wall. And if you left a little bit of the color that was there before, you missed, in other words, you missed a spot. It showed up and they called them holidays, which I love that, that, that thought. So these little sparky whites are what we call holidays. This is a great brush. This brush is, I, I like working with synthetics. I don't really wanna use sables don't like the idea of them. And so the synthetics are so great right now that I really Im just want to embrace them all. And save the sable horses. Don't have to take their little tails off. It's not necessary with all the technology we have these days. I mean, I get it years ago, you know, when they would create these things, they looked around at their world and said, well, you know, this is what we need to, to do. But we have bigger, better options nowadays. Now this little spot in here is going to be around his legs. So I'm gonna get in there, right in here. So when you're doing reverse definition, you really have to pay attention to those types of areas that you are defining. You're not just painting the background you're defining the foreground, you're defining this body. And see how he's popping out? It's really just such a wonderful process. I like having all my brushes readily available because I never really know what I'm gonna want at what time. Now the value of having these two colors, the indigo and the dragon's blood uh, to create this background is now I could switch to a cooler color because I don't want to disturb the warmer color that's on his body. So I could switch that. And I could also go much lighter back here too. I don't have to have everything be so, so dark.
Let's see how that looks. We could go very dramatic with the background, but I think that, you know, that could be a decision I make when I start seeing it dry because seeing it wet, it dries so much um, lighter watercolors because we're using water. The color we put down is often much, it appears darker, but it, it dries lighter. Just basically giving it water to move. And then we just have that one little panel there. And then I'm gonna go back and look at what needs to be done to him, her, I don't know. I don't know whose dog this is. The reason why I'm dragging my brush, I know my students might be saying, she's dragging her brush, she normally doesn't do that. The reason why is because I'm creating a somewhat of a texture as I'm doing that. So it's really giving me a chance to find some holidays, get some texture going on there and move the color all at the same time. So you'd be right, I don't normally do that. Just thought I'd clarify. By moving my brush, I am getting some nice texture. And then I could go back in this area so I could show you an idea. This is my sexy scumble brush. This is what I did to my sable brushes. And what I could do is take some of the colors that are in the, um, the dog and I could just slightly add some texture that gives it that feeling of wood grain. See that? So we can always, we always have options like that of adding texture to it. And it gives that feeling of wood grain. And the reason why this is what we call my sexy scumble brush is because I have a specific way in which I cut my sable brush to make it all scratchy and giving us this, what we call thirsty brush feel. I want to go in and just work a little bit more on his, um, to see a spot where that blue came in. I don't want it there. So I'm just going to lift it. Lots of ways to correct. If I, if it really was dry, it was, it was still wet when that blue popped in there. If it was dry, there was a lot of ways I had to correct it. Magic eraser is a good way. Lifting is a good way. There's a lot of good ways to lift color if it, if something happens and you're not happy with it on your paper. So it's not true that we can't correct a watercolor. Just doing his little nails right now, giving him a Matty Pitty. And now I do feel I need to go back to his nose. So that's, um, you know, now that it's dry, I worked around it. I do feel I need to sort of go in and do a little bit adjustments to his eyes and nose. Just a little bit, not a lot. So when I talk about this is what you do to build a painting, it's important to know that it may not just be there. And you don't have to honker down on an area and, um, as I say, kill it because you need to work it. You need to see what's happening. You need to see it in relationship to the background. You need to see a lot of that happening. Okay. 
and what was oh, it was a nose I was going to do. Sorry, I was stuck on his eyes, and I know I have to do his nose. And you know, there's always a little bit of pink in their noses too. So you want to get a little bit of pink in there. These things just have to be, you know, you need a little time and patience to just build it. And a little understanding that you just have to allow the paint to do the work for you. So there's one more thing I want to do that I want to show you, and that is whiskers and um, little, you know, they always have a little bit of fur and hair. So I use my, um, they're not really watercolor brushes, but they do a really good job. And these are just makeup brushes. And what I do is I want to get a little bit of the fur effect. So I'm just sort of getting some, any color from my palette on my, my brush. I just want to make sure it's sort of a dry. And then I could just build some nice feathery hair fur. So I don't know if you can see what I just did, but it just lightly gave it. I wouldn't do it everywhere because I don't feel that that ne is necessary, but I like the idea of finding a good few spots that really um, make sense. And I will just say this, more is not better. <laughs> so what I'm doing now is I'm just taking my brush and I'm melting some of those spots into his body a little bit. Maybe back here a little bit, just a little bit. Usually you see these marks like around their ears. And then I wanna get the whiskers. So I'm gonna use a, a rigger brush to do that. Rigger brushes were actually developed to paint the rigging on ships. So I want my arm to move freely. It's not this, it's this. So my finger are locked in with the paintbrush and I'm gonna move my whole arm. I'm just gonna turn my photo just so I get the right angle. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull. The whiskers out. So it's a, it's a quick sweep. And it's very subtle. I'm just melting the marks a little bit where it's hitting his face, just so that it's not so harsh. It says enough without going crazy with it. And I think I'm just about done got a little bit more time to work on it, which I'm going to take. But if there's any questions that anybody has, I'm. Uh... Jen, can you show everyone the original uh, photograph? Yeah, sure. So any comments out there? Your guys are very quiet tonight. You must be like drinking or something. I don't know. They have been quiet. Yes. Well, before we end though, I just wanted to say I would love to do this again. I think the everyone who participated really enjoyed it. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate uh, you guys sponsoring these. Um, it's just been a really fabulous experience doing these live paintings and 
giving people sort of a, a little bit of an intro into, uh, you know, coming into the studio without the worry of, I've got to produce a painting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea how it's going to come out. I don't know anything, but that's sort of the fun of it is for me is like, okay, let's just go in and see what happens. If there's anyone participating on Zoom that would like to ask a question, if you raise your hand virtually, I can unmute you individually. So there's that little dot there. There's something called a scrubber brush, sort of a bristly brush. I don't want that. So I can just with a little bit of water I can lift that right out and not worry about it. Now you guys saw me do like a big boo-boo last week with the, uh, when I was doing the hair. <laughs> Jan, but, Elaine has a question. Hi, Elaine. Hi there, Jan. Hey, I just wondered what kind of brushes your small brushes are? Um, your white I, ones here. Yeah, this is sort of new brushes for me. I, it was given to me as a gift. They're called S-C-U-R-T-I, Skirty, I guess it's pronounced. And I'll just show you, somebody asked about it a couple of weeks ago also. It came in this, sorry, everything's dropping. It came in this like really nice little package here. Um, and S-C-U-R-T-I, oh. it's a really nice little, I, as you can see, I haven't taken 99% of the brushes out, but, um, I have been uh, working with some of the smaller ones to sort of test them out a little bit. And I like them. Cool. Okay. And now Kristen has a question. Hey, Jan, on your palette on the right. Um, so I've been practicing my watercolors and, you know, it dries up overnight. Can I just add water back to that palette and reuse that, that color or oh, do you yeah. really start Absolutely. from scratch every time? No, I, I, I just go right in and if they're dry, I don't worry about that at all. They, I just go right back in and just dig in my brush to get my paint. So yeah, I don't worry about that at all. And I don't reload it either because I find that um, very often when I have fresh paints in here, it's just too much. There's just too much pigment and I can't control it. So I really like that they're dry and I could go in and I could wet it and I could pull out into my well, whatever I need, uh, because the wells are pretty big in here. Right. And I don't really care for the fact that it may, if my paints are all really wet. I, I know there's some teachers really love like fresh, wet, juicy paint. Oh, cool. okay. And now <laughs> Kristen has a question. I'm hey, sorry? On your palette on the right, um, so I've been practicing my watercolors. And you know, it dries up overnight. Can I just add water back to that palette and reuse that that color? Or oh, do you yeah. really start from scratch every time? No, I, I I just go right in and if they're dry, I don't worry about that at all. They, I just go right back in and just dig in my brush to get my paint. So yeah, I don't worry about that at all. And I don't reload it either because I find that um, very often when I have fresh paints in here, it's just too much. We, Margo has a question. Hi, Jan. Um, Hi, I know you've done two portraits of uh, dogs with short hair. Could you just be, and I know you said curly hair dogs are difficult. Could you just speak to, um, or give some tips a little about doing dogs that have curly hair? Yeah, um, it's the same answer that I would give for doing hair on people. And the answer really has to do with um, simplifying and finding the big shapes. So um, I'll just pull this up for a second. You get the feeling that she's got curly hair, right? It, just because of how I handled certain larger areas. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to show you. Maybe I do. Um, here's a good example. This was another portrait that I did. And so you could see that I would just try to find some large areas that gave me the curl. And you, you don't really have to um, depict it all, if, if, if you know what I mean. I mean, I think you could leave some things 
to the viewer's imagination. I had to do two curly dogs as a portrait uh, a comp commission, and I really wanted to just kill myself. <laughs> it was really hard. And, and to make it even harder, one dog was had passed and one dog was alive. And so I had to somehow blend the two together. So that was really uh, very challenging. I, but it's it has to do with that simplification. So if you could make it a very um, uh, very black and white, it might help that. So I see a little tufting there. So I'm going to take this brush. Does that answer it, Marco? It's it's the simplification. It's something in the simplification of finding it. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. See how nicely that brush just gives me some nice fur marks. I would be hard pressed, I think, to do that in an hour. <laughs> I really do. As much as I would love to say I could, it's possibly. But yeah, that curly stuff is tough. Only because you just want to have it be fresh and looking and not overdone and, and not do every single hair. So, um, I am feeling like I'm going to let this rest for a little bit, maybe a little bit more, um, a little bit more texture up here just to carry it through. Um, but I'm feeling kind of done with it. I'll let it sit. I'll look at it and compare it to the picture a little bit more and see if there's anything more I need to do. I think I just have to go a little wider on the face there, perhaps. Maybe tiny little things, not a whole lot though. Not a whole lot. Well, thank you very much, Jan. Um, we have some folks on YouTube who are all complimenting your work as usual and thank you and thanking you for doing this. It is really been so much fun having everybody kind of come into the studio and watch over my shoulder. <laughs> you've seen the mistakes happen. Hi, Barbara. Um, you've seen the mistakes happen. You see me correct it. You see me able to make um, changes to go back and to build the painting. That's really, uh, I think, such an important part of it. I think Barbara has a question. Unmute yourself. Um. Oh, do you have to mute her? I, I have to unmute them. Barbara who? Barbara Gariel. She's oh. waving at us. Okay. Oh, we have a whole bunch more people who came on. Hi, everybody. Okay, Barbara's unmuted. Thank Barbara. you. Um, yeah, it was funny. The person, the person asked about the skirty brushes. I was going to ask the same thing, uh, but what sizes were you using? Because those just really look fabulous in terms of being able to do some of that detail. They were. Um, it, I was using a four and uh, it's called a one and a half. When you buy brushes, it's interesting because they're really, I, I've, I've spoken to Brian at Reeves about this. There's no uniformity to how they say, oh, this is a 10, this is a 20. It's all kind of like whatever they want to make it up to be. But I used um, my my number 10, which this is uh, one of my favorite brushes. I got this, I, you could get these at almost all the museum stores, you know, so I love those. And uh, these new skirties, I'm like, it was um, a, a surprise gift from, from someone, from one of my students. And I just started using them. I probably don't need them at all, but they've been kind of fun to practice with. And do they bounce back nicely, Jan? They're snappy. They're very, they're short and they're very snappy. Yeah. They have I, I, I bought the um, silver, uh, silver velvet smaller ones, and they're, they, I don't like them like I like the twenty. They're kind of, they're kind of limp. They are. So this is the twenty, and you could see it definitely, you know, is more limp but that comes in very handy when we're using the edge of it because the big it one yeah the big one but the small ones i wasn't happy i, I only got this 20. i mm. don't have any other sizes yeah. on this one for whatever reason mm. although i do have some students that love those brushes and enjoy them i like 
as you're saying, I like a, a snappy brush that bounces mm -hmm. back. That really makes, makes a big difference. So yeah, I don't know where she got them from. I have no idea, but I'll hold it up again for you guys if you want to see it again. This is, if you could read that. And this is what how it came. So I took a couple of the brushes out. I used, yeah, I've used like three or three of them, I guess. But it's a nice little set. It's yeah. These, these were the two that I got, Jan. I got a six and an eight, um, three thousand S. Right. That's the uh, that's the black velvet. Right. Sure. And these and the, look look how wimpy they are. They just kind of they're not snapping. So. Yeah. I know, and and um, that's why I only have a twenty. <laughs> Thanks. I like my twenty. Yeah, but I, I never got all the other ones. Right. Yeah. Right. So once again, thank you, Jan. Thank you to everyone who's just signed in and different formats. And hopefully when we do this again, we will see you then. That sounds great. And thank you, Harbor Fields and South Huntington Libraries. Support these libraries, guys, because they're wonderful and they're bringing great programming to you. So, um, you know, whatever we could do to uh, engage with them and let them know we appreciate that, this kind of programming. I feel like Bob Ross or something. I don't know. Should I have like curly hair or something? Should wear like the wig? <laughs> All right. So, Goodbye, oh, everybody. Rest of your summer. Hopefully I'll see some of you on um, the YouTube. Um, uh, uh, not YouTube. My, um, my classes. We're starting a portrait series. Um, we are doing Tuesday. We're going to do a bumblebee in flowers. So I got, I posted that this painting had sold. And a lot of people started asking if we could do something like this. So we're going to do this on Tuesday, and we're going to start a portrait workshop class on Thursdays uh, yeah, next week, not, this, not tomorrow. So, um, yeah, we're going to keep it going. All right, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mwah. Adore you all. Hi to Freddie over there, I see him. Bye guys, bye Marco, Lorraine, Kathleen, Pat. Thanks for coming, Alice. Thanks for coming on, say hi Marco.